welcome to the WikiTree Challenge. Hi, I'm Mindy Silva. Welcome to the WikiTree Challenge Highlights Reel. Today I have Peter Roberts and Meg Scalden from MitoYDNA. Welcome. Meg's is just a little bit excited. <laughs> just a little bit. I'm never excited. I'm going to talk a little bit about WikiTree first. For those of you that don't know who we are, um, for those people, our mission is to grow one accurate shared tree that connects us all, is accessible to everyone for free forever. It's all about collaboration. There's one profile per person. If you and I share an ancestor, we work on that profile together. It's not that you have your tree and I have my tree. It's all one big tree. And did I mention that it's free? We just passed the 34 million profile milestone with almost 11 million of those having DNA connections attached to them, which is really exciting in relation to this, Megs and Peter, because, you know, I think um, that number is probably still going up. We had so many people get excited about their DNA this week. It was really fun. Um, at any rate, what really makes WikiTree work is its community. And a cornerstone of our community is our honor code. So anyone can see the profiles on WikiTree, but to edit anything more than your close personal family, you have to sign the honor code. And that just emphasizes sources, giving credit, courtesy, understanding, accessibility, accuracy, and of course, respecting privacy. Now, privacy is another aspect of WikiTree that makes it special. Even though we're growing a one world tree and we all collaborate, only close family members collaborate on those modern family profiles. So as you go back in time, the privacy controls open up. Collaboration on deep ancestors is between distant cousins who are serious about research, careful about sources, and willing to see their research validated or invalidated with DNA. So if you aren't a member yet, come join. It just takes a minute to register a guest account and you can delete a guest account at any time. In here. Now, Challenge 8 was a unique one. Our partner is Mita YDNA, a nonprofit form from a group of collaborative genetic genealogists, many of them leading WikiTreers. It's a place to upload your Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA results for matching and analysis. Um, like WikiTree, Mita YDNA is crowdsourced, free, and accessible to all now and in the future. They gave us seven names. We had seven days to find every direct DNA descendant that we could. Now, this was different from our usual challenge where we look for ancestors and we look for uh, relatives in seven degrees in all directions. So our starting people were, and I think I kept our three Catherines straight. I'll tell you what, <laughs> Catherine, Catherine, and Katharina. Um, it was fun. But we had Auchin Rowe from Ireland. We had Catherine Swo Rowe at Swinford from France, Catherine Unknown Strutt from England. We had Ivor II of Waterford from Ireland, John Thorpe, who was from England and then Massachusetts Bay later, Michelle Savage from France and later Netherlands, and then Katharina Famberg, or Von Famberg who was from Bavaria. So Peter or Megs, do you want to tell us how you chose those seven people and a little bit more about Mito Y DNA? Um, one of the interests that I had was some of the most outstanding things about WikiTree. And one of the things that I tracked was the line in WikiTree, the lines in WikiTree that have the direct mail lines that have been Y DNA tested and are also in WikiTree in terms of the number of generations going back. Um, and so we had, um, so some of the ones that are selected are in Mito Y DNA, their Y DNA is in Mito Y DNA, or their mitochondrial DNA is in Mito Y DNA, and they have extensive lines, or they've got uh, several people of that same line are also in Mito Y DNA. So these were some of the most outstanding um, uh, DNA, some of the most standing, outstanding DNA information in WikiTree. It is outstanding. It really is to have lines that go that deep. It's crazy cool. 
Well, and Mags, while we're here um, talking with you, do you want to tell us a little bit about how this this challenge week affected MitoY DNA? It affected us in a really cool way. Not only did we increase, I haven't even looked to see if the to, to look at the Facebook numbers, but our Facebook users group for MitoY DNA exploded big time. Um, but more than that, the most important thing is that the amount of users that we usually get a month has been at least doubled. And the amount of kids we've had uploaded has been tripled or quadrupled. So that's really, I got chills just now saying that. It's very impressive uh, <laughs> what Wikitree has done for mitoydna.org. Pretty cool. It is. And, you know, this is the whole point, though, of the community outreach as far as, you know, you got more members and more people uh, uploading their DNA, which is awesome. And we want to see that anyways, as you know, uh, a genealogy site. But also we had more people come in that went, oh, wow, they're doing a DNA challenge. I want to see what they're up to or I want to learn from it. it so we it, both really, benefited. It, it really opened up the ability to teach, too. Um, there were so many people who sent me messages or contacted our group or, or talked about the challenge in other groups like the eyesight group or whatever, wanting to know specifics about why in mitochondrial DNA, how it happened, how it, it, it is inherited in a family. There were people who didn't really understand it who now have a good understanding. And uh, Eowyn picked the uh, question of the week. For this past week as uh -huh. have mitochondrial dna results affected your family history research and we've asked that question before in the the saturday morning live cast but the the answers had changed this time a lot more people answered a lot of people answered no but a lot more people answered yes they figured out how to use it in conjunction with autosomal dna or in conjunction with DNA group projects, it was really, really, really a great opportunity to teach and for people to learn about why am I a kind right. DNA. There are so many people that take an autosomal test like Ancestor DNA or 23andMe. So many of the people take those types of tests and they want to use it for their ancestry going back for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And you can't do that in terms of it, oh. it peters out after, you know, when you get back towards the 1700s, it starts petering, petering out. But with the mitochondrial DNA and the, and the Y chromosome, you can go all the way back to the earliest um, profiles in Wikitree. I, I love the way you said petering out there, Peter. <laughs> I usually do, do that in reference to Y chromosome. Uh, yeah, it was intentional. <laughs> I know. <laughs> He's a funny man. Yeah, and you know, I saw that as well, Mags. I saw people that have had their DNA tested, but they didn't really know what to do with it. So it's just kind of laid there. You know, and this challenge week, they went, oh, I got to get that out and dust it off. And now I can find out <laughs> what I'm supposed to be any, looking at. How to, are there how any to do statistics on the, the, the Wikitree side about how many more people might have entered in those tests they had laying around? No, but I should have asked the text to check that. Yeah, I yeah. really should have. Um, cause I know there were, you know, I got a lot of comments about that and they were like, oh, I have my test done a couple of years ago, but I really couldn't figure out what to do with it. So, <laughs> well, and that was another thing people were asking about how to upload their DNA. Oh no, you don't upload it. You add the test information. It's just like, um, GEDmatch in terms yeah. of your autosomal right. DNA, you add it to GEDmatch with the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, you add it to mito Y DNA. Well, we were talking about adding to Wikitree, so. Uh, to wiki tree yeah. yeah and as a matter of fact i just had another person ask me that this morning like a half hour before i came in here she's like we can't figure out how to upload the test and i went no um you don't upload it you can upload it go to mito y dna and upload it or you know go to GEDmatch. as many sites as you can go ahead and upload it and then just put your kit numbers on wiki tree we don't take the raw data at all um do you we know don't what do else i noticed data comparison like ancestry does so Greg has added uh, a, a confirmed link in, in the DNA citation confirmation statements that links off either to GEDmatch or MitoY DNA now so that you can actually see the two kits or the three oh, kits wow. involved. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it is pretty cool. 
I didn't see that till Saturday really cool, while huh? I was live. Oh yeah, I hadn't even noticed, and I was just working on those last week. So he just did that, or yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. He's a smart guy. Yeah, he's such a great guy for giving us toys to play with. Yes. Well, I'm going to go ahead it. and talk a little bit about our top, our top people, and yes, that is intentional. That Margaret is up there twice. We have Margaret, who is our most valuable participant <clears throat> or MVP. She added, <clears throat> excuse me, she added an amazing 327 direct descendants. Wow. 327. It's crazy. And, you know, for all the uh, amazing numbers we had, if the, we would have had a couple of our other top performers up this week, too, I think that would have, you know, been even more. Um, but she was just out of everybody's league this week. But she also wound up being our top bounty hunter, you know, which they get special points for either finding interesting vines or finding a family connection that we've listed as a brick wall or uh, making a new connection to the global tree. So she was just cleaning up. She was just cleaning up this week. She did an amazing job. And, you know, we also had TL um, Kuhnlein, who was our captain this week. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you to them. Um, great job. But it takes an entire team to collaborate and come up with these outstanding results. And we had more than 72 people participate wow. in an incredible show of collaboration, right? 72. And, you know, I know, we had so many people sign up for it. And then a bunch of them went, um, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I don't know what to do with the DNA stuff. And I said, you don't need to know the DNA stuff. Now, if you want to play with it and look at some connections, that would be great. Um, you know, but if you don't want to, it's just genealogy. It's yeah. work, we were just working in another direction. So working for descendants instead of trying to build out. But, you know, that benefits the living people, too, because you've got those older ancestors on WikiTree that have got thousands and thousands of descendants. And, <clears throat> you know, you start working yourself down. And pretty soon you're going to start hitting all these, uh, you know, recently deceased people, which will connect to living wiki or so all of a sudden they're going to get up one day and go oh wow <laughs> somebody attached this you know whole line to my grandmother and great grandmother yes. and they've got this huge amount of ancestors they didn't even know they had that is so cool i love seeing all those names and act and seeing a bunch of people that i know it's so cool yeah i love it so here we're going to take a look at, oh, you know, we love Relationship Finder and stuff oh, on, yeah, yeah. on WikiTree. We, we love our tools. Um, here we took a look at which ancestors are the closest to each other. So while Catherine Swinford is not related by blood to any of the others, um, is only eight degrees from Katharina Famberg and 14 degrees from Catherine Strutt. We have John Thorpe, who's 13 degrees from Michelle Savage and 14 degrees from Catherine Strutt. We have Ivar the second of Waterford, who is 17 degrees from He's Catherine one of my Spiker. great, great, greats. Is that one of your great? As is as is Catherine Swinford. So when this challenge started, I had I also had two ancestors in this challenge. And now I only have one because <gasps> one was because fortune. I mean, it's kind of good yeah. is that it, a line was corrected and validated. Yes. And um, so now I've got more a more accurate tree, and I'm appreciative of that. But I'm yes. sad that I lost an ancestor who, where I knew their where I happened to know their mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. Right. Yeah, you know, and that's always a tough part, and that's something we look at really super hard when we're in the challenge. Like, if we have to uh, detach a line, we get several people in there. We'll get this little group going, and we'll all look at the sources to decide if that's, you know, <clears throat> invalid or, inv or valid. But, you know, I appreciate that, too, as well, because if I've made a mistake in my branches and I think somebody's my second or third great grandfather and somebody comes along and they can disprove that. Well, that's good for me because, you know, I was claiming somebody as an ancestor that really shouldn't have been there. And plus, a lot of times that will cause a brick wall because the relationships after that don't make any sense because they shouldn't be attached. And so, you know, sometimes it'll even help you get to a better place in your, in your genealogy. 
We sidetracked you completely. You know that. You're fine. You can sidetrack me all you want. <laughs> we had fun with the week, Megs. Um, you know, and here we looked at two. We always have a lot of fun with Connection Finder and Relationship Finder. And we look to see who we're the closest to. We always check that. Alesh has those great reports for us where we can see when our distance gets closer and stuff like that. And here is uh, TL's connection to Catherine Swimper. So it actually shows the path. I'm closer through. than him. Are you? I am. So how many is it for you? He, 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 she's my 19th great grandmother. <laughs> you just skated under by one, one great grandma, one generation. <clears throat> so, but that was kind of cool that this wound up, you know, one of the starting ones wound up being his, his great, 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 great grandmother. <laughs> And then here's another connection. <clears throat> we had Princess Irina Alexandrovna Yusupova was born in Peterhof, Russian Empire. Now, she was the daughter of the Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich, also known as the Grand Duke of Russia. Princess Irina is 17 generations from Katharina von Fanberg being her 19th great-granddaughter, and then 18 generations from Catherine Swinford, being her 16th great granddaughter. So there must be a lot of descendants, Megs, right? That come off those two. Uh, yeah. Catherine. Yeah. Catherine Roy was uh, a, a quite the, uh, the other funny thing is, is that a part of her marriage to Edward said that she couldn't have any, any of her offspring could never be in, in the Royal line. And with, uh, was it Richard the third was, or Henry, one of the, like within a, a grandchild became King of England. So. Oh, yeah. wow. I'm looking to see if you guys connected me while you're doing that to connect me to anybody <laughs> else. Now, since we had leaders and aristocrats from England, many of which of course had descendants that migrated to new England, we took a look at the connections to one of our early presidents John Quincy Adams, and the closest gener connections were Catherine Swimford at 14 generations, and she's the only actual ancestor. That would be his 12th great-grandmother, and then Catherine Strutt is 12 degrees from him, and Katharina Fanberg is at 19 degrees. You didn't connect me to anybody else. I'm still connected to who I was connected to, though. Nanner, 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 <laughs> Peter. We didn't take any away, at least. Nope. <laughs> now we'll take a look at some other interesting finds. And we're going to start with Auchinrow's lines. Now, he was born about 970 in Ulster, Ireland. And he was an Irish nobleman who had a stronghold on the water of Rowan Derry. This Y-DNA line, which is currently believed to extend back 30 generations to 970 AD, has five test takers. So I know, like as Peter was saying... You know, you guys picked some that had some really good long uh, DNA lines for us to work with. And one of the descendants we came down to was William Monroe, the 12th Baron and the 14th of Fouli. Now, he was born in 1455 in Rothshire, Scotland. He was a Scottish knight and Scottish clan chief of the Highland clan Monroe and the 11th Baron and 13th Laird of Fowley. He's 15 generations from Aachen Row, being his 13th great-grandson. Now, Aachen, of course, was an Irish nobleman whose son Donald aided in invading Scotland. So um, I'm thinking Donald's ancestors were rolling over in their grave because, <laughs> because he was invading their country. What is it? To the victors go the spoils? Yep. <laughs> now we had, next we had Catherine Swinford. She was our second one. Catherine Rowett Swinford, and she was the Duchess of Lancaster. She was born about 1315 in Somme, France. When she was young, she went to work with Queen Philip Philippa of Pinell's house. Um, she later became the governess of the children of Blanche and John of Gaunt. And in 1387, she was made a lady of the garter by King Richard II. 
So, you know, she started out uh, just working, doing simple work in a house as a house maiden and worked herself up to a lady. That was pretty cool. But we found a lot of tragedy in Catherine Swimper's lines. So the first we have here is Alexander McDonald. Now, he died when he was struck by a train at Boston's Back Bay Station where he was working as a watchman. His remains were returned to his longtime home of Port Hood, Nova Scotia, where his funeral was presided over by his cousin, Bishop Alexander McDonald, who not only shared his name, but also his date of birth. So that's really interesting. They that were is born interesting. Day. And Alexander is 14 generations from Catherine, being her 12th great-grandson. So the second we had, also involving a train, was Arthur Goring Thomas. Now, he was born in Wellington, England. He first appeared in a census at the age of one, where there were 21 people in his home, 14 of which being servants. Now, Arthur was an English composer of operas uh, and songs, and he was considered to have remarkable abilities and some say genius. But, you know, he struggled with depression and mental illness. And so, you know, kind of goes to show that no matter what your upbringing is and how much money you have, when you have some sort of an illness like this, mental illness is real. Um, you know, it, it isn't necessarily improved by anything by your status in society. And, you know, unfortunately, he ended his life quite tragically in 1892 at the age of 41 when he jumped under a train at West Hampstead Station. Now, Arthur is 17 generations from Catherine Swinford being her 15th great grandson. Can you imagine back when we were doing this all on paper and stuff? I mean, think back and you had to like figure everything out. And now you just like click on somebody and it goes, oh, it's your 16th cousin once removed. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> So 13, or thirdly, was Pierre de Bone, who was involved in a hunting accident in 1713 that ended in the Justice Court. Now, this one was not um, him being injured, but according to the declaration of Joseph Bastion, the gunshot which caused his bed rest was shot at him by Pierre, believing he was a wolf. <laughs> So, you know, luckily Joseph lived to tell that tale and that was not a tragic, sad one. And, but... and thank goodness it wasn't a silver bullet. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm kind of wondering, you know, I keep trying to picture what um, this Joseph looked like now, because if he looked like a wolf out there in the wild, <laughs> maybe he was very hairy. I don't know. Now, Pierre is 13 degrees from Catherine Swinford, so it's his wife that's the direct descendant. And then we move on to Catherine Strutt. She was born about 1520 in Suffolk, England. Now, some claim that she was the daughter of John Scott and Ann Pimp, but her maiden name and parents are really unknown, you know, per the Strutt ancestry of Thomasine Frost by Harold Porter. And, you know, there's been a lot of research into that. And really, there is no definitive proof of anything for her maiden name. So she remains Catherine Unknown Strutt. But this is great that we wind up with so many descendants that, you know, are getting their DNA tested and can help fill those lines in. I found this line to be most interesting because it goes back to 1500. And there really is no, um, as far as I can tell, there's no nobility associated with it to be able to take your direct female line back that far is a pretty phenomenal with just paper records so that is then and it also to have it why do you um, have it um, mitochondrial dna tested so hopefully some descendants are going to also take a mitochondrial test a distant cousin of the, the one who tested and we can see that the ancestry is accurate with the comparing of the mitochondrial dna yeah, that's that's our hope. I mean, the more people that test, the better. Go out and tell your friends and family. <laughs> test if you haven't done it. We need to we need to find out more about these lines. Now, here we have down in her branches, uh, Betty Copsey Mount, 
She attended Duke University and graduated from the Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School in New York City. She then joined the editorial staff of Good Housekeeping magazine, followed by two years as an editor of What's New in New York. Now, she spent most of her life in New Jersey. Uh, she moved to Brunswick in 1987 and counted more than 40 years of active involvement in a local theater, both as an actress and then uh, later after a swimming accident, which paralyzed her from the waist down. The lady, it didn't, she just didn't let it stop her. So she worked as a drama reviewer for several publications. She was also an active member of the Summit New Jersey Playhouse, the YWCA, a founding member of Clearwater. I mean, it just goes on and on, the things that she did. And, you know, in 1974, she received the um, Benai Barith Americanism Award for Distinguished Community Service. And, you know, boy, what a role model this woman's like, my hero. I mean, she just did a little of everything. And she is 13 generations from Catherine being her 12th great granddaughter. Yeah, you know how people always say that that Charlemagne, everybody's related to Charlemagne. I think everybody's related to Catherine Roy too. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> She's she seems to be related to everyone. Prolific. Yes. Now, also down in her branches, we had Cheryl MacArthur, and he was a coal miner. He was a superintendent of the Desiree Coal Mine, the president and founder of the American Coal Company. And he was really active in many coal mining organizations and also a public servant. So he served as mayor for three terms. He formed a mining company. Um, he was a president of the Rocky Mountain Mining Institute, and, you know, he did a lot of big things as far as the mining industry goes. And, I mean, he just did a little bit of everything. He was also uh, involved in a director of the First Securities Bank. So, you know, but this is the part I love is that here this man had done all this stuff, you know, for the mining community and really making sure it was organized and led. And... Um, you know, his wife was, he was an active member of the LDS church and his wife was an author. And he said that one of his favorite things that happened in his life was that he was called to serve with his wife on a mission to write about the history of the Desiree coal mine. So she had to, you know, go to this place and write this history. And he just stopped everything he did and said, I love my wife so much. I'm so happy. She's passionate about this. And that wound up being one of the things he said that was, you know, his, his favorite, um, his favorite memories. Nice. And Cheryl is 14 generations away from Catherine being her 13th great grandson. Wow. Now we have Ivar II of Waterford. He was uh, a Norse king, and he, at least from 969 until his death in 1000. So we're talking like a long time ago, people, <laughs> way back there. My was... 30, 31st great grandfather. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, this one's on my father's side. The other one was on my mother's side. Catherine Ruet was on my mother's side. <clears throat> so you have the, you have the, uh, royalty and the non-royalty <laughs> yeah the royalty side dad's side was the royalty side it's all over on that side yeah we've but got it was... lots of different ways on my dad's side he's actually a dna match to czar nicholas oh wow yeah That's i'm really his cool. 34th great grandson you are mm -hmm. That's the hey, one cuz. the one in the group that i'm related to hey cuz Hey. <laughs> now he was the king of Dublin twice um, until expelled by Sigtrig Silkbeard and there are many tales of documented plundering um, on, if you look on his wiki tree profile there's all kinds of stuff that he did his his plundering and adventuring was very well documented throughout his his time so 
And this one was just fun. It was a king and a king. But this was Albert Nelson Monroe, born in Swansea, Massachusetts. He was known throughout the country as the cattle king. So he dealt in the export of cattle. Now, he married twice, having a total of 13 children. Albert lived, incredibly at that time, to the age of 83. So um, a cattle king, not a Norse king, but a king nonetheless. And he is 28 generations from Ivar of Waterford, being his 26th great-grandson. And you'll notice that the relationship is marked uncertain, which is really one of the things, and we talked about this earlier, that I love about Wikitree, because each one of those confirmed relationships will really clearly uh, show you that that's proven. So that gives you the opportunity to focus on those uncertain links and go, oh, wait, here's a relationship that needs further records, documentation. Let me, let me research that a little bit. Um, you know, and this wasn't the most recent person. So to be able to say, oh, we stretched out 28 generations. Uh, that's really incredibly good. The wiki treers are amazing. They just really are. Now, Albert is actually much closer to a few names that we do know. So he's 17 generations from David Lambert. So fifth cousins, five times removed. He's 18 generations from Scott Fisher, six cousins, four times removed. And he's 19 generations from Amy Johnson. So six cousin, five times removed with her. So yeah, they they uh, picked up some new documented cousins <laughs> Yay. this week on with the tree so with the, these connections. There are some Monroes that are actually um, cousins to Mac, the McDonald's. And then there's Monroes that were tested that descend from Roe. Why do you know this, Rose. Peter? Because it's in WikiTree. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cut that. That's awesome. Because <laughs> it's in WikiTree. So, no, yeah, that, so I, I learned something here. I learned something here. That's great. That's really cool. Well, I mean, you think about the sheer amount of descendants that each one of these starting people have that you gave us. And so, you know, the chances that some of them are going to have duplicating names, I mean, is, um, yeah, big. Because this takes us back before the inheritance of surnames, when the when surnames yeah. were right. fixed and were inherited from son to son to son. 945, right. so it's, it's a good... If you start with 1066, it's four generations before that. And if you start at uh, 1500, we're talking, wow. 1500. One, of the, one, of the, one of the things that I hope will happen is that more people in this line, in these early lines, will do, will do big wide type testing and yeah. where we're using the SNPs, not just the STRs, because that would yeah. be really helpful to actually flesh it out. Because there are some, some of these early lines where the... Um, the the Y DNA is not matching. Their the their the genealogy is saying they're one family, but the, the Y DNA is not matching like it should. And so there's some corrections right. that can be made. And that can be with the early lines that can be made a lot easier using the SNPs with the Yeah, big only see test. one seven hundred test. Yeah. And we need we need another seven hundred test to compare with that. Yeah. Yeah. That would put them on a new branch of the tree too, probably. You know, so hopefully if someone will get motivated. If they belong to this line, they'll get motivated to test somebody. You heard it right here, folks, from Peter Roberts yep. himself. Get tested. Here's your opportunity to make a change. And Here's really your opportunity to make Peter happy. <laughs> For sure. That too. That too. So we'll go back to looking at Albert here, who once again was 20 generations from Ivar the Second. So really interesting, you know, that you're able to make these connections back to people that um, really didn't have surnames yeah. and, you know, know that it went that many generations and that was really a, a real connection. Now, here we have somebody that liked to govern that was also a descendant and this was Richard Graves and here's that surname, McDonald. Now, he was born in 1814 in Dublin, Ireland. He was the sixth governor of South Australia the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, and the 17th McDonald of Leinster in Ireland. Wow. So several places around the world are named for him, including McDonald Road in Hong Kong, 
the McDonald Ranges and Sir Richard Peninsula in Australia. So this guy really got around. I mean, he was just all over. And he is 20 generations from Ivar, a Norse king, uh, being his 26th great grandson. So our fifth starting person was John Thorpe. Now he was born about 1608 in England. He migrated to New England by 1632, residing in Duxbury, Plymouth Colony. And Harry practiced his trade as a carpenter, so something that he'd probably learned in early adulthood in England. And the y and I, y DNA line on this stretches back 11 generations to about 1608, has nine test takers. Five are in mito Y DNA, which is the most for a direct line found in WikiTree. So I imagine that's why you guys wanted this one done, correct, Peter? Yes, for sure. And down in this descendants, we found Mr. Zebulon Thorpe, and he was one that intentionally changed the spelling of the surname. You know, and we see a lot of variations of surnames, which could make record finding very difficult sometimes anyways, but he intentionally changed it. So he was born Thorpe in 1707 in Woodbridge, New Jersey. He moved to Virginia later in life, and he changed the spelling to Tharp. So he was also listed in 1761 as being militia led by Colonel George Washington. Ooh. So that was a cool connection. And he is three generations from John Thorpe being his great grandson. And then here we had Marie Tharp, who was a descendant of Thomas Thorpe. And she was notable. She was an American genealogist and ocean, or sorry, geologist and oceanographic cartographer. And she's credited with creating the first map of the Atlantic Ocean floor. That is so cool. That is incredibly cool that we discovered that because of this challenge. Yes. I love the little, you know, the little bits of people's life. And of course, you know, we're trying to document and honor these ancestors by preserving their lives, basically. So, yeah. you know, when we look through these records, we always try and find that it, sometimes it's hard, you know, but we try and find those little things that set them apart from other people. So we're always looking for occupations or occurrences or, you know, just different things that um, situations they could have been in that helps you realize what was going on in their life. And of course, it's always fun to find something like this where, I, you know, this made an incredible change for some people. So I can't imagine just deciding one day, oh, I think I'll just map out the ocean floor. Yeah. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah. I'll just. I'll and, just and, and I would want to, I want to read and find out how she did it. You know, what yeah. year was it? What kind of, was it with Jacques Cousteau? Was it, you know, what, how did she do it? So that would be cool to find. Yeah, seriously. Now, Maria is the seventh great granddaughter of John Thorpe. So nine generations away. She's also the eighth cousin of Kevin Bacon. Now, Michelle, uh, Michelle Savaggi was our sixth person, likely born circa 1575 in France. The parents have been proposed for Michelle, but no evidence has actually been found to prove this one. Uh, they first married Zacharias Cleus Flamen and second, Geronimus Tricot, also known as uh, Jerome Tricot. There is only one mtDNA test taker listed on WikiTree for this line. So, uh, you know, this is another one. I guess we need some more mtDNA tests yeah. popping up so that hopefully we can start filling in these, these different lines. Now, here we had as a descendant, Charles DeWitt Clinton. He was uh -oh. the sixth. Is this going where I think it's going? Oh, look at Peter shaking his head. <laughs> Peter says no. Yes, no. Um, he was the sixth governor of New York. He was also the 47th, 49th, and 51st mayor of New York City. Wow. His love for governing came from assembling of the convention, which formulated the Constitution 
of the United States. So, you know, wow. we just thought it was really cool that like he got so caught up. He wasn't even thinking about a politician and he got so caught up in reading everything he could about this constitutional convention that he went into politics after that, you know? So, and then he wanted he, to make a difference. Yeah. He's like, Oh, I can, I want to do something like that. I want to have passion about my job. Uh, I think he, you do. <laughs> I do. He was the first governor who recommended the observance of days of public Thanksgiving by the people of the state. And he has counties named after him in six U.S. states. I bet. Megs, nobody's named a county after me. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Not Aww. yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We'll see. Now, Charles is seven generations from Michelle being her fifth great grandson. And he's also 11 degrees from George Washington. So. And back then, I mean, of course, you know, they couldn't make those connections for themselves. Right. I mean, we know now. Got to make those connections. Yeah. We know now that everybody's connected somehow. But, you know, back then they didn't think like that. And this one, a lot of the members were just really impressed with. We have Lemma Barkaloo, and she passed the bar without finishing her law degree. And she was the first woman to try a case in an American court. So, I mean, she didn't even go through all of the classes and finish everything out. And she passed the bar. You That's know, impressive. I, right. There are people out there that go through all the classes and then they go, sit for the bar three times. You know, I mean... Now she's eight generations away from Michelle being her seventh great granddaughter and coincidentally is sixth cousins three times removed from Roberta Estes. <gasps> so Roberta. Yeah. it was funny because, you know, we bring these up all the time and we look at connections all throughout the week. And of course, these are so distant, you know, that to find like Lemma's connection to Michelle, Michelle's like way down on the list. And we kept seeing all the genealogists from the first year of the challenge pop up. So <laughs> that's cute. Yeah. With like Amy Johnson Crow. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was so much fun. Now, our last one was Katharina von Famburg. And she was born before 1332 in Famburg in the German Reich. And she was the daughter of Ulrich III, Graf von Famburg. Her life events are really largely undocumented, so most of her dates are just estimated, and there's only one mtDNA test taker listed on her profile. <clears throat> and, you know, that was another thing that some of the members worried about with the challenge. They're like, okay, but, you know, these people were born pre-1500. What are we supposed to do with them? Yeah. You know, um, we're not going to be able to touch those. But, I mean, Wikitree's been around long enough now that most of those older lines like that are already developed. So, you know, you just need to start working your branches out until you hit one of those. And all of a sudden you're going to have, you know, you might have an extra 12, 15 generations. I mean, you really don't know. And we only actually wound up with one profile that I had to go and add a child for because uh, somebody wasn't pre-1500 certified. Only one. So considering, wow. you know, the huge amount of profiles that we touched. That was crazy to me. That's great. That's that really says something about how well early lines have been worked. And it really says a lot to some of the early pre-1500 projects that are going on, that they're really caring for curating these these early profiles. Yeah, and projects even themselves have come so far since Wikitree started. And, you know, there's so, ma there's so many of them that are mature now. And definitely, if you haven't joined a project yet, it's so easy to, you know, go to the find menu on Wikitree and look at projects and start looking through what there is. Because this is all, I mean, once again, this is community sourced. So this is all dependent on people that go, oh, I think I'll put a little time in each month. And, yeah, and they, the I love the new I love the new orphan trails that they have going on. So you aren't mm -hmm. joining a project without any 
if you join the project without any knowledge, you're going to gain the knowledge because they're going to teach you how to do it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and some people go, oh, well, but I've been doing genealogy for 40 years. Okay, but you haven't been doing genealogy on WikiTree for 40 years. So, you know, and I, for me, I'm always open. I want to see how other people look at stuff and maybe get a different point of view or pick up new resources. You know, I bookmark everything. I'm like, ooh, I didn't know you could look at that site for, you know, for France or whatever. So I'm going to bookmark that and save it for later. But they also teach you a lot of the ins and outs of using Wikitree itself, which we know has, you know, um, is is difficult when you first start. There, It just has a big learning curve. It, yeah. There's just so much to it. Um, but, you know, once you get the hang of everything, it just, it's second, you know, you don't even think about it. It's just, you just automatically uh, do a lot of it. But when you go through these trails, you know, that's one of the things they do is they go, oh, let me teach you how to use the markup and make that, you know, bold or indent a paragraph or something like that. So, you know, nobody's saying that you're not a good genealogist and you don't know how to research if you have to take a trail. It's just that there's one for each one of these main projects and more and more of them are starting those up for Scotland and, and, and you, different you places. learn the intricacies of, of researching a certain area. It's, it's a, those are uh -huh. really good trails. One thing that I want to point out about this direct maternal line is that it's the one for Tsar Nicholas. It yes. was they they recovered his remains and they were able to extract his mitochondrial DNA. And so that's what's going up and down the uh, direct maternal line is his mitochondrial DNA. Did he have a heteroplasmy as well? Peter? He does. And yeah. the thing is is that mito Y DNA is one of the few is a few only site really where you can input um DNA from uh, archaeological findings in terms of uh, human remains. You can put the DNA from that, and you can actually see and compare with the that mitochondrial DNA or that Y DNA, as the case may be. In terms of that, the, the database allows you to put in those. Um, this comes from a research paper that yeah. was published, and we were able to put that into mito Y DNA, and you're able to compare your mitochondrial DNA. Um, with that, with his Sorry, and other Nicholas. others that are already in there, other human remains. Yeah, that's just incredible, you know, to think about that connection to modern people, um, that it has such a profound effect on so many. So here we have, uh, you know, of course, Katharina had so many interesting discoveries. And I don't know if the, her lines were just more documented or if these researchers were just happening to find so many things. But it was really, really hard to pick what things to show for her descendants because there was there was a lot. So for her, I decided to focus on affairs of the heart. So that's the theme for um, Katharina's lines. Now, first we have Anna von Soxen, and she was the wife of Prince Willem van Orange Nassau. And she couldn't get used to life in the chilly castle Dillenburg. And so after her daughter Amelia was born, she went to Cologne, where she could lead her desired opulent life. Now, she lived so exuberantly that her husband was allowed to separate from her in 1571, which, yeah, you know, might happen nowadays, but back then that didn't really happen. And then eventually she was accused of having an affair with Jean Rubens, and she was actually imprisoned in the palace in Saxony. And not he's the father of um, Paul Rubens? Yes, the, the father, father yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. she was not allowed to see her children at all. So she wound up dying six years later. And then, of course, the irony is that her husband, Willem, was definitely not a saint because from the very beginning of the marriage, he had many mistresses. But, you know, in those days, uh, that was okay. Now, Anna is nine generations from Katharina being her seventh great-granddaughter. Here we have another one, and this was a late-in-the-week find. It was interesting. Uh, we have Carl von Holstein's love affair, and it actually played out quite a bit in the newspapers. So, apparently, when he was introduced to Mildred Harrison, who was a Philadelphia heiress, he was smitten at first sight, 
And according to the newspapers, you know, he chased her all over the U.S. and stalked her basically until, or courted her, however you want to look at it, until she agreed to marry him. So they married about nine months after they met. And then at that point, he goes, oh, all those stories were not true. Um, we had an understanding from the beginning this was a planned marriage. Well, it obviously wasn't because <laughs> it's very well documented his chasing her. And That's then it did, the story did take a little bit of a sad twist. They had a daughter that died young. Aww. And then the wife moved in with her parents. And then, of course, the you know, then the newspapers are saying, oh, she just wanted his title. Um, you know, that there wasn't any love involved or anything like that. And it's really more likely that she was just very distraught, you know, after losing her daughter. I mean, that's that's understandable. She wanted to go home to mom and, you know, spend some time there. So he wound up returning, the count wound up returning to Germany to fight in World War I since he held a commission in the German army. And he was killed in 1916 and poor Mildred never remarried. So, you know, it's not like she was out um, looking for love. She, her man was gone and, and she never remarried. I love how you make that into a really good love story. <laughs> <laughs> a tragic one. Yeah, a, tra a tragic <laughs> one, but, but a love story. I mean, he, you know, he followed his true love everywhere. So here we have uh, Carl von Holstein, of course, is the 14th great grandson of Katharina. And I think that was the only bit of anybody that was, um, you know, there was a lot of aristocrats on her line, but not really royalty or anything like that. Like he said, her, her beginnings even weren't, um, you know, she, she didn't descend from royal lines. So it's really interesting to see how many people we found connected to her that were documented. Now, finally, we'll look at this and whether we support war or not, our veterans give all of their support to protect our country or their country. And because of this, we like to acknowledge at least a few of them. So here we have a few from World War I. And one of the participant favorites was Lillian Frost. Now, she was an MTDNA descendant of Catherine Strutt. She served as a nurse in the Army Nurse Corps during World War I. She served in France with the American Expedition Forces. And her military headstone and documentation reflects her service. Nice. Two of her brothers also served with Sherman, serving in Germany. Um, Sherman served in Germany and Allen served in France. So all three of the siblings uh, served in World War I. Now we had William Joseph McDonald. He was a Y-DNA descendant of Ivar. He served in the U.S. Navy as a seaman, second class for about a year. Major Arthur Dow Newman, MTDNA descendant of Catherine Strutt, served in the U.S. Army from 1910 to 1920. He graduated from West Point in 1914 served overseas during the World War. He died at the age of 32 from injuries sustained when his horse threw him during a polo match. So here he survived the war and then a tragic death at a polo match. Uh, he's buried, of course, at Arlington Cemetery with a beautiful headstone. We had Major General Robert Lynn Copsey, husband of Vivian McNamara, and this is an MTDNA descendant of Catherine Strutt. Now, according to his obituary, he was a pioneer in civilian and military aviation. He held a pilot's license, get that, signed by Orville Wright. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Were they able to get that pilot's license on Wikitree? I don't know if they had an image of it or not. Um, I'd have to ask the researcher that, but that was That would be cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then for a German soldier, just to throw something different in the mix, we had Christian von Saxon Weisenfels, who was um, a third son. So, you know, he wasn't going to get any of his father's inheritance. So he dedicated himself to the military, befitting his status. And in 1673, he recruited an infantry regiment and fought along the Upper Rhine. In 1677, he was appointed general sergeant of the electorate of Saxony. 
He also took part in the relief of Vienna in 1683. In the Great Turkish War, he led the Saxon Auxiliary Corps in Hungary of 4,200 men at the Siege of Offen. So, I mean, he was out there with, you know, large, uh, large regiments. And in the subsequent Palatine War of Succession, an imperial war against expanding France, he took part on the side of George III of Saxony. So he was very successful as a, as a commander, as evidenced by his appointments. And in 1689, at the age of 37, he was fatally wounded by a musket ball during the siege of Mainz. So, you know, I mean, he says, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have the title and all of the goodies that go along with being first son. So I'm going to go out and be important somewhere else. And he did. And wow. then on WikiTree, yeah, crazy. On WikiTree, we're all connected by blood or marriage. So there's 29,504,580 cousins on WikiTree, alive or not. And, you know, another thing that just happened, this was really exciting this week, is we surpassed 1 million members. We're so excited that Mito IDNA helped you guys do that. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You yeah. did. Thank you, Megs and Peter and Mito YDNA. <laughs> it, was, it was exciting. We all kept watching the number go up. You know, we were waiting for it to hit that, hit that uh, million number. I wanted to ask, did the, did the person who was the millionth get, get a winky button or did we send them a t-shirt even? He got something. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah, not sure good. what they decided to do for it. So we're, yeah, about, they were, we're about there to get to 30 million going, there. There was a lot of talk going on the, um, the week of it going, well, how are we going to figure out who actually signed up at exactly 1 million? So then the techs had to figure out, you know, how they were going to calculate that and who that person was. Um, yeah, it was really exciting, though. That's fun. And then here's one of Alesha's maps. And there's actually some locations that I missed. I wasn't aware of. They were so busy researching this week. So, you know, we started out, of course, with these super early ancestors. But once again, there are so many descendants. By the end of the week, we know for sure that we researched in these following locations of Australia, Bahamas, Canada, Chile, Denmark, England, France, Germany, Ireland, Netherlands, New Zealand, uh, some German Polish states, Prussia, Scotland, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United States. But I noticed on there, there's like Australian stuff too. So, you know, there's some stuff that I didn't even realize our people had ventured into. And I think on the squares, um, we just have some unknown locations. You know, if people Not don't put any locations, and... yeah, if people don't put a birth and death location, they wind up with weird locations on the map. So, <laughs> and then the for the road line is in the Bahamas. And that's why they, re they would be researching there. And that's why you know them so well. I was wondering two, about that. Two of the um, YDNA testers are coming out of the Bahamas. Oh. That's really cool. And I want to double check the number on this. I know. Um, yeah, I I was excited. I was thinking in Greg Clark, actually, because when I was getting ready to do the wrap-up for this week, I was getting the uh, total number of descendants that we added. So keep in mind, there were a lot more profiles than this added, but these are the ones that counted in those direct Y or MTDNA lines. And we were at exactly 1,100, and somebody sneaked in three more profiles right at the <laughs> end. So there were 1,000... 103 direct DNA and you know way to go I mean you guys yeah. you just, they're amazing that's an incredible number because I, had, I, had, so I, I was not near I was not I thought it wouldn't do as well as it did um, I, I thought really these, well. these are lines that have been researched a great deal already many of them and yeah. for the, the wiki tree researchers are incredible incredible they are they are. They always amaze me. And, you know, and I remember talking about this at the start of the week and Meg said, oh, maybe they'll add hundreds of people. We'll see. And Peter went, hundreds? How are they going <laughs> to add hundreds? One of the things in the early on, 
when we were um, trying to select the Y DNA and the mitochondrial DNA that we're going to use and what those ancestors that, that, that I chose, I was suspecting that we might get maybe about 300 additions total and in terms of the number that, that we but would you're not get. And I, I, was, I was shocked out of my Man, mind. Wait, 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 Mindy's supposed to tell us all that. You're not supposed to well, say Well, anyway, okay, we'll, 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 we can cut this part out, and then we can we can do it again. <laughs> I, can, I can edit, Megs. I can throw it at the end if you'd like. <laughs> but um, I was shocked out of my mind in terms of the, the, the fact that there are now over a 1,000 profiles that have been added that ha are connected to these lines is absolutely outstanding. It is outstanding. Right. And because yeah. uh, these branches all look so full. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just tell a wiki tree or go do something or they can't go do something and see what they do. Let them loose. Yeah. <laughs> wiki Let them loose. Uh, are amazing. And then if you have any questions about the presentation or Wikitree, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, or Wikitree.com. So don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel. And while the image credits play, I'd like a minute to thank all of those incredible people. So more than 72 people worked on this challenge and contributed and crazy, crazy good. They found such an amazing amount of discoveries. They were a fun group to work with. Uh, so many people were brave and, you know, they went, oh, I don't know what I can do this week. But they jumped in there and, you know, they tried Amazing. and worked on it. So, yeah, it was just it was so much fun. And then, of course, you know, TL Kuhnline for captaining this week. And then you guys, Megs and Peter, because, you know, you gave us these seven starting people. You worked with us from the beginning so that we could do this exciting DNA challenge and you know you fielded all of our questions when we went oh I don't know how we're going to do this we usually do ancestors how do we do descendants and you know you guys were right there for us so thank you so much for um, partnering with us this week and thank you and for sending my DNA numbers through the roof thank yeah. you we are most grateful to have, to have yeah. participation and the publicity yeah, oh, it's great to have the publicity. Thank you. Great so opportunity much. for both of us. Yeah. Thank you, Mindy, for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure.